Well, it's been mentioned, my name is Ron. I'm the lead pastor of Vital Point Church, and we are uh, passionate about starting churches in small towns, and I am so glad to be uh, together today like this. It's amazing. I want to jump right in with a bit of participation, and I don't want you to participate right away. I will cue you when I want you to respond. When you look at your life, you probably have these moments where you realize that you are created for more than what you are doing right now. You don't necessarily know what it is, but you have this sense. It's like spidey senses on the inside that say, there's something else for me. Or maybe you know what those things are, but you have not yet fulfilled them. For example, some of us have this passion or this desire, dream to write a song or to write a book or to start a business or, or maybe try to solve a problem in our world that you see and you're passionate about it and you have this idea. When you look at your life, you probably recognize that there's something inside of you, these hopes, these dreams, you, these imaginations that you have. Now, here's the participation part. Now, how many of you feel that or have felt that in your life? I just want you to put your hand up. Just put your hand up. Just go for it. That's great. All right. Maybe you're a little bit uncomfortable putting your hand up because it feels like church and you're not comfortable putting your hands up for church. Maybe just look to the person beside you and give a nod and say, yeah, that's me. See, there's something we must understand about these things that are inside of us that we have a sense of, that we're created for more, or these dreams or aspirations or the things that we imagine, is that they are placed there because God has placed them there. Every human being was cre is created by God. You are not an accident. We are created by God who is a creative being. You know, sometimes we think of creativity as, well, the creatives, the, those people have that. But the realization is, is that we are created in the image of God. So therefore, we are creative human beings. We dream, we have aspirations, we imagine, we kind of have these passions inside of us. And the realization is that God has placed them there. The very fact that you have these things, to me, is proof that there is a God that we are created in his image. So therefore, we have these things inside of us, which sets us apart from the rest of hum humanity and sets us apart from creation when you think about it. We as humans are set apart. Like my lab, when she's five-year-old lab, she doesn't, you know, I don't think she does, lie awake at night dreaming about sustainable food sources because every time she eats the same thing, she's excited the first time as she is the second time. And she just loves her food the way it is. Or a horse doesn't get together with other horse buddies and kind of go, man, I just wish my life was something else. The realization is that God has places in us. Now, the other thought is this. Like, why don't we move towards these things? Why don't we fulfill these things? You know, because we come up with all kinds of excuses, right? We, we come up with, well, the opportunity hasn't presented itself, or, or maybe you don't feel smart enough, or maybe there's insecurities, or maybe you don't have enough money, or the environment isn't right for me to fulfill these things, or maybe you, you have a sense that people around you won't support you in these things. We come up with all these excuses. I know for me personally, I have this, I have these moments where I realize that God has something for me, that there's more inside of me, but I come up with all these excuses. But I also believe that there's something even bigger. And this is my opinion on this, but, and I might be wrong, but there's something bigger that causes us to not step into those things that God has for us, and it's fear. Fear of failure fear of what other people will think, fear that we might have to make adjustments to our lives. And in the fear, we come up with the what ifs and then we begin to lie to ourselves and the fear begins to cripple us from stepping into, uh, stepping into the dreams that God has for us. Today, we begin a brand new series called Fear Less. And we're gonna spend some time looking at an Old Testament character by the name of Gideon, who happens to be one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament, personalities. And what we're going to do is we're going to discover that on the other side of our fear are the things that we are created for. When we have a breakthrough with fear is when we begin to realize those things that God has created us for. And my prayer is this, that as we fear less, we will live into God's destiny for our lives and ultimately fulfill what God has for us. So let's jump in. Let's jump into Gideon's life. It's found in Judges chapter six, seven, and eight. 
At the beginning of the story, we must realize, this is a bit of the backstory, we must realize that God's people, Israel, are living under the heavy hand of a people group called the Midianites. God has permitted this to happen. God has allowed this to happen. I wanna read it for you in Judges chapter six, verse one. It says, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. Now, for some of us, we read that, and it should spark a bit of a question inside of our minds. Like, hang on a second. I thought God was love. God is love, right? And it's true. He is love. And you read this, and we kind of go, wait, what? How could God allow this to happen? How could God allow the Midianites to, um, to put pressure on his people for seven years? See, we must understand this, that God is a holy God, that God requires justice. He requires that justice out of his holiness and out of his love. It's interesting when you think about, if you've been around the church world long enough, just one second, <coughs> excuse me. When you think about this and you've been around church world long enough, there's this word covenant. It's a beautiful word. It's a word that we rest some of our truth on and a lot of our truth about God. And it's more than just a, a contract. It's, it's a covenant, it's a vow that God has made. And we often talk about the covenant of grace. It's this thing that God extends to us through the person of Jesus Christ in spite of our sin and our brokenness, God extends it to us. But there's also this other piece called the covenant of works. And the covenant of works is God saying, when you live to honor me and to glorify me in, my, in your life, and you make choices that align with what I want for you and desire for you, then what happens is we experience more of God's promises, more of God's presence in our lives. And so we look at this and we experience the beauty of the covenant of works. But when we live outside of that, like the people of Israel were doing in, in Judges chapter six, verse one, they were doing evil in the sight of the Lord. So therefore we reap the consequences of those choices. God's people, once again, have been living outside of God's design, doing evil in his sight. And the Midianites, God uses them to put pressure on his people for seven years. And it's described that they devoured the land. They left no sustenance. They were like a locust crossing over the land and cleaning the land out. And God's people, they hide. They hide in caves. They hide in strongholds. And fear has gripped them. Now look at verse six. It says that, and Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out, cried out for help to the Lord. In their crying out, God sends them a prophet. Now, the prophet is the voice of God, is the representative of God in the Old Testament that would bring correction, that would bring truth, that would bring reminders as to who God is. And in this moment, the prophet says to the people, you have not obeyed my voice. He's speaking on behalf of God. The prophet speaks into the reality of the state in which they find themselves in. See, the people of God had allowed themselves to be distracted by the things of the land, the, the, the people groups, their gods, their, the distractions, they would make idols out of them. And the first commandment is what? That you shall have no other gods beside me. And these people had done evil in their sight. And the prophet reminds them of this. He speaks truth to them. But then we have Gideon. All of a sudden, we have this emerging personality that begins to step into a moment that God has for him. Look what it says in, in uh, Judges chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. It says this, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth of Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abazarite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Gideon now is going to experience a moment in an interaction with, with, with God himself. He doesn't recognize that at the beginning, but we find Gideon thrashing wheat in a wine press. Now think about this for a moment. He is afraid. Fear has gripped him. Sure, we can applaud his creativity, but we must recognize that thrashing of the wheat was to be done out in the open so that the wind would blow the, cha the chafe away and that the seed would be available to them. And then the wine press is used for what? Crushing grapes and making wine. 
We recognize that in this moment, fear had gripped Gideon. See, when fear takes a hold of our lives, we lose the ability to see clearly. We're gonna see this over the next number of weeks where Gideon loses perspective on who he is, who God's people is, and even who God is. Jamie Winship in his, in, in his book, um, in a book on fear, fearing, fearless, um, he talks about this. He talks about when fear strikes us. He says, there's something that happens to us when fear takes over. We become um, irrational because our brains, the front of our brains shuts down. It's that fight, flight, or freeze response. And what happens when we fear is we become fixated on that fear and we lose the ability to make good choices. In some ways, when fear takes over, it's like we're in in a fist fight with fear in the darkness and we're just swinging and we can't seem to make contact because fear has caused us to lose perspective. And when we lose perspective, we lose the, the understanding of what is true and what is not. And so we begin to believe the lies that we tell ourselves. So when we live in a state of fear, we're unable to fully know the wonder of what God has for us, right? We talked about it at the beginning. The reason why we need to fear less is so that we can begin to fulfill God's design and destiny in our lives. But when fear takes a hold, we can't live into those things. And I also wanna propose this to you, that it's not only just within ourselves where we have this sense of fear, but I am convinced that the enemy of all that is good from God, which we would refer to as Satan or the devil, the enemy loves to use fear to hold us back so that we will not step into what he wants for us, what God wants for us. Think about it this way. Fear limits our ability to step into those things that God wants for us. And in our stepping in, we become fully alive in the person of Jesus. I wanna read a verse for you, a verse that I think is important for our conversation. It's Ephesians chapter two, verse 10. It says, for we are, are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk into them. Let me explain this. Generally speaking, out of God's creation and you and I, we all humanity is created in the image of God. So therefore, these things are planted inside of us. So generally speaking, each and every one of us has these dreams, these passions, these ideas, these aspirations. Psalm 139 speaks to this truth. But for those who would say they're followers of Jesus, we must recognize that in relationship to Jesus Christ, there are specific things that we are created to do referred to as good works prepared beforehand by God. Now, I know some of us right away are are having this fear rise up inside of us. We're like, well, how do I know? What if I miss it? What if I know? Here's what I want you to know. You don't have to fear missing out on those things because they cannot happen without you. If God has created it specifically for you, it cannot happen without you, but we can miss walking into them if we allow fear to have a place setting at the table of our lives. Please lean in on this. The good works created in Christ, prepared for us to do, will be fulfilled as we take steps into what God wants for us. And there are many steps and it will almost feel like I was created for this. You'll be able to look back. See, this is interesting. You'll be able to look back over the course of your life and you will be able to see the moments that God has set up for you in seasons of your life where it has shaped you for this particular moment. I was reflecting on this and praying about this as I was contemplating that I was created for this sense of the good works prepared for us. And God revealed something to me in my preparation for this message. That the heartbeat that I have, the good works that God has created for me to do to initiate and plant churches in small towns started in 1979 when we moved from Toronto to New Brunswick. I was so excited about this when I was putting this talk together. I scribbled these notes out, this this journaling, and I ran upstairs from the basement to see my wife. And I said to Desiree, "The, the passion, the good works prepared started in 1979. The good works will always serve 
a greater design within the grander purposes of God's reality in this world, which means his kingdom will be revealed. The enemy will do whatever he can to stop that from happening because when we walk into those things, we become dangerous for God's kingdom in a good way for the things that we are assigned to do. The enemy of God's purposes knows that you will become dangerous for the kingdom of God in a good way. So therefore, the fear that he uses tries to keep you in the darkness so that you will not step into what God has for you. So what he'll do is he'll throw these fear bombs in front of you to keep you back. Because when we step into those things, the light shines brighter. Think about Ally Global for a moment. We partner with Ally Global. It's an it's a organization out in British Columbia. And the beauty of this organization is they help people who are rescued from human trafficking and sex trafficking, and they create spaces for them to find hope and healing. Imagine if Randy, the director, allowed fear to hold him back. People would be left in darkness. When we are trapped by fear... It restricts our ability to be obedient. When we are obedient, it means that one's faith becomes stronger and more resilient and alive to God's reality and realm become more known in our lives. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but God actually prefers obedience than he does worship. Think about it this way. There's a conversation in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, were, uh, for Samuel has a conversation with King Saul. Look what he says. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the, the fat of rams. Samuel says to King Saul, God prefers for you to obey and to listen than to offer worship to God. It's this important conversation around obedience and fear because sometimes we can fall for the trap of, well, I go to church and I sing a few songs and I memorize a few Bible verses, I pray, I give some money, I have some religious activity and we can fully miss out on the reality of obedience is more important than worship. And oftentimes the fear keeps us from stepping into that place of obedience. Obedience reveals the good works created in Christ Jesus. We walk in them as a natural outflow of the small steps of overcoming fear. When I think about this, I sometimes fall into this verse. I sometimes, I don't fall into it. That's just a weird phrase. Um, I sometimes think about this verse in the New Testament. It's in the New Testament book of James. James chapter four, verse 17. When I think about not being obedient, not fulfilling what God has called me to do, when I allow fear to hold me back, I think of this verse in James chapter four, verse 17. Listen to this. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. How many of us would say sin is the ugly things that we do, right? The gossip, the, the cheat on our taxes, watching pornography, having an affair, stealing work pens, right? We would all go, those are the big things that are sin. But knowing what we ought to do and not do it is also a sin. You feel that you need to find a way to forgive someone who's hurt you and you don't do it. That is sin. You know you need to get your finances in order and you don't do it. That is sin. When you know you need to start tithing and you don't do it, that is sin. You know you need to step into a leadership role in the life of the church. You need, to, you need to step in and serve in an area you know inside of you, but you don't do it. That is sin. What is sin? Missing God's perfect mark, which means we are not fulfilling the things that God has done. Obedience is a key in forming our faith, and obedience is a way in which we silence the voice of fear. The enemy would love to cause us to stumble and fall in this area. But obedience is faith in action. And when faith is in action, fear has very little room to work in our lives. As I was thinking about this and pondering these things for us, I began thinking to myself, well, if this is true, if this is a reality for us, then, then maybe we can, we can conquer fear. Maybe we could banish it from our lives. 
but I don't know if that's possible. And then I did some extra reading and I was, and then I came across this thing that helped me understand that we can actually have authority over our fear. See, when fear grips us, it has authority over our lives. But then I began to realize that no, we actually have authority over our fear. Look at this verse. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. For this reason, I remind you to fan the flame, the gift of, uh, fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. This is a guy named Paul talking to a guy named Timothy. And then he says this For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self control. Paul saying to Timothy, You have this thing, it's called a gift, you have this thing inside of you, fan that into a flame, you are responsible for that. It is your, no more excuses, no more putting it off. It is in you. Paul even laid hands on him and prayed over him about this. But then he drops the bomb. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. This is a beautiful three, three under, uh, this is like the, the aspect of the three parts of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There are three things that we are given, fa- the, the power, the love, and the self-control. This is what I love about the Christian faith. This is what I find so powerful about the Christian faith is that there's this power, there's this inner working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I think what happens for a lot of people who are afraid to give their lives to Jesus is because they have this feeling that they won't be able to do it or they won't be able to walk it out or won't be able to fulfill it. And the reality is there is no such thing as the Christian faith apart from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the power that brings the transformation that helps us to overcome the fear that we have or to have authority over it. And then the love. The love is the the wonder of the growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Fear, fear fear-based living has our eyes focused on ourselves. It's an inward-focused perspective. Love that he's talking about here is the growing dynamic of prioritizing our walk with Jesus, his unwavering presence with us, which leads us to self-control. Self-control is the practical aspect of our genuine faith that is being lived out, which gives us what? Authority over our fear. See, in the power, love, and self-control, what we must understand is that it takes us a moment to step back and say, I have to confront my fear. I have to confront it. I have to get with some people to confront the fear and then to call the fear out. It's like someone hiding behind the corner and you know they're there and they're gonna jump out and they're gonna scare you and they're gonna put it on some platform and, and it's gonna go viral because you scream like, you know, it's like, no, you're gonna call it. I know you're there. You call it out. And in that you conquer it because you're gonna invite Jesus into the fear to walk with you. He doesn't wanna just kind of fix it from afar. He wants to be in it with you, to walk into the reality of it. So the, the good works prepared for us to do are walked out in Christ. So the beautiful understanding is that fear no longer has to have control over our lives. This leads us actually back to Gideon. This takes us right back to Gideon again. What did, the, what did the angel of the Lord say to Gideon at the end of the two verses that I read for you? What did he say? The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Courage to face fear is grounded in the promise that God is with us. This sounds so cliche, And I know that in church world, we can kind of go, oh, like God's promise is with us. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it great? And we don't actually stop because here's the reality of it. When he says, the Lord is with you, what he's saying is this, is that my presence is with you and the love that I bring into this is the love that will conquer the fear in your life. 1 John 4, 18 says this, love is, when perfect love is present, it casts out fear. It's not just that God is present and that's great. It makes you all feel warm and fuzzy on the inside. No, it is more than that. It is deeper than that. It is richer than that. It is the presence of God's love and his mercy and his grace and his kindness. 
So when we allow God's promise that he is with us to fill our lives, it means that love is present, his holiness is present, and in that, fear has no place, for which means we can have authority over it. Our theme this year is what? Unwavering faith. We've been talking about it for a week now. Unwavering faith grows as we stand in the promises of God's presence with us. This truth is important for us because if we're going to fear less in 2024, if we're going to step into the things that God has created for us as individuals, as families, even as a church, it is going to take the, 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 the power that is available to us, this unwavering faith to actually have authority over it so it no longer has control in our lives. So what area do you need to invite Jesus into? Because the truth is this, what you fear the most is where you trust God the least. And we must ask ourselves, how do we invite him into that so that we can overcome this, so that we can fulfill the good that he's created for us to do? So as we close our talk today, I'm gonna to ask that you grow in your unwavering faith by claiming your authority over your fear because of the promise of God's truth that he will be with you. How beautiful it would be to navigate the complexity of this year ahead with this, with this phrase, fearing less so that we can fulfill what God has for us.